Hello and welcome to Cheetah TV. My name is Brian Badger from the Cheetah Conservation Fund. Now continuing with this series of videos looking at all the ins and outs and all the different um, aspects of CCF that go in to make up the holistic approach to conservation. Today we're going to be looking at cheetah husbandry and caring for both the releasable cheetahs and the non-releasable rescued cats that are currently um, being housed in Namibia. Now, if you want to learn any more about this particular project that goes beyond what we can cover in the video, then please visit our website at cheetah.org. There you'll find lots of information and also details of how you can help sponsor a resident cheetah or a livestock guardian dog and lots of educational material as well. Now, I took the opportunity to speak to Becky Johnson, who's the uh, a cheetah keeper out in Namibia. Um, to get a little bit of an insight and behind the scenes information about caring for the cheetahs in Namibia. So now it's across to uh, Namibia to speak to Becky and learn all about our resident cats. Hi, Becky. Hello. <laughs> Hello, all the way from Namibia. Um, I say so we, we've known each other for, for quite a while now, but uh, why don't you tell everybody who you are and what you do? Yeah, uh, so my name is Becky. I'm one of the cheetah keepers here at CCF in Namibia. So I get to look after all the captive cats uh, that we currently have here at the center. I'm sure you're the envy of, of uh, everybody, everybody watching, but uh, we'll, we'll go into the, the ins and outs of, of what that actually means and what that um, involves because I um, mean how many cheetahs are, are at the center right at the moment? Currently we are at 38. 38. Mm -hmm. Yeah and out of those um, the the majority of those are, are the non-releasable cats is that right? Correct yeah so at the moment uh, we have of the 38 five that are releasable and the rest are permanent residents here. Okay, so the way that you look after those cats is is pretty different, I would imagine, because um, you 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 with the with the five releasable um, candidates, they they have to be kept away from the centre and and to stop that um, <clears throat> that habituation. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So our release candidates are kept about a ten minute drive away from the main centre. Um, so it's only myself or Eli that go out to feed those cats. Uh, we'll only use typically one vehicle with them. So they're not getting used to seeing tourist vehicles around. They're not used to our safari vehicles that we're using on tours. Um, they only will see our food truck. We'll go out, we'll make sure that uh, they're healthy, that there's no cuts or scrapes, anything like that, that everybody's healthy. We'll feed them make sure that their water is topped up, their enclosure is clean, but then we will leave them. We don't spend any extra time with those cats. We don't do any sort of extra training or anything with those guys. We want to keep them as wild as we can. Yeah, that, that, that's great. It, it's, <clears throat> it's sometimes, you know, you, you, it's, it's a shame that every cat can't be released when it comes into CCF, but that's, you know, that, that's life, unfortunately. And um, so when you're, when, when a cat comes in, uh, once it gets through the initial stages and it's deemed to be healthy and, and it can go out into the, to the holding areas uh, of CCF, how do you start with your, you know, you, so obviously the, the keepers have to start building a relationship with those cats. And um, I think it's important to point out that they're not turned into pets or anything or, or, or anything along those lines, but uh, for the management side. So when, when it comes in, what, what are the stages of, of that um, building that relationship with the cats? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing for them is getting into a good routine. So they love consistency. They like things to stay the same. Um, it really helps to reduce stress in a lot of our captive cats to keep things the same. And so getting that cheetah into that routine where we come out, we're feeding them at the same time every day. We're feeding them typically in the same uh, feeding camps, in bowls, from the food truck. Um, getting them into that routine is really important for them. 
Um, but as well, just spending time with them, um, especially with the young cats that come in that are maybe only a few months old, they're scared. All they want is their mom and suddenly mom is taken away from them, their siblings are taken away from them and we're what they have. And suddenly there's new people, there's new sights, there's new smells. And so getting them just into that routine, but spending a lot of time with them and building up that trust with them. They know us that we bring them food and that's the best part of their day typically. But that's really all they care about. They don't really care about us as people, I don't think, but they care about us bringing them food. So that really helps um, build that relationship and build that trust always if there's food involved typically as well. You bring up a very interesting point about the uh, about the routine. Um, I've, m myself, I've worked with with many species of, of cat over the years, and the cheetah is very different to 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 other cats. Um, and and I think it's worth um, kind of highlighting that really, it, because the the cheetahs are, are are born nervous. You know, they're born scared because yeah. they've got so many enemies. So yeah. a natural routine, um, now correct me if I'm wrong, um, but, they, uh, but that gives them that uh, almost like a sense of security. They kind of know, and you're taking a lot of the fear and the unknown. Uh, would yeah. you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. So I think they, they, as you say, they are very nervous animals. And if we feed them in a different way every day, and we feed them in a different spot and at a different time, they don't know what's coming. And in a wild cheetah, that's true. They don't know when their next meal is coming, but if they're gonna be around people and around us, it really, really helps to calm them down to have that really consistent routine. And with our cats that have been here for a long time, or 15 year olds, for instance, they need that. If we feed them in a different time or in a different way, they get really mad at us. They get really upset with us. Um, so, but it really does help, yeah, to, to calm them down because they, they are very, very nervous animals. Yeah, I mean, you, you, can, you can categorize a cheetah, you know, as, as a species, and we, we know what they're, what they're stereotypically like as, as a species, but then you get the individual traits as well. And um, I think that, that uh, that's incredibly important with, with uh, keepers like yourself, that, that uh, you understand and basically what you need to do um, is, is to um, <clears throat> identify what's normal. Yeah, exactly. And that's why it's important for us as well to have a, a smaller keeper staff in a way. There are a lot of animals to take care of and it would be great to have maybe six or seven people looking after them but then you don't have that consistency. And the fact that Harry doesn't come up for food today might be normal for some people, but for us, that could mean that something's wrong um, for that day. And that's really important to pick up on anything. The tiniest little things can be a big deal, can become a big deal really quickly. And the faster you pick up on those, the faster we're able to treat maybe any problems that are happening with them. Yeah, so it's very important to, to identify any potential problem very, very early. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so I mean, any illness, because they are very sensitive animals, as you said, they can get sick very easily. Um, they're really prone to stomach issues, to digestive problems, and that's really important that we treat that right away um, so that it doesn't become a, a big ongoing problem for a longer term. So feeding um, 38 cheetahs on a, on a daily basis, um, that, that, that in itself is quite a task. So you, you do all the, uh, all the food preparation yourself, is that right? Uh, so luckily we do have some interns right now, some volunteers uh, that will also help. Um, but a lot of it, yeah, is double checking everything. Um, so every day each cheetah gets one kind of piece of meat. Um, it's about one and a half to two kilos. And we do prepare all of that. So it's cut for us by some of our workers, but then we go in and we make sure that there's no small bones, uh, there's no excess fat on the meat, and just making sure that each piece is prepared properly. 
and then sorting the meats, like you were saying, based on the individual. Um, because some of our older cheetahs need really soft pieces um, versus some of our younger cats can have a spine piece, they can have a leg piece, they can have a rib piece, anything like that. So making sure uh, that every cheetah um, is getting the right amount um, and also just the type of piece that they're getting too. So you, you said about the, um, the, 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 the diets being different or the uh, requirements being different for individual cheetahs. So what, what is the, the, you know, what is the age range of, of cheetahs that you've got there at the moment? Uh, at the moment, our youngest uh, is just under a year old. Um, and then our oldest is, uh, they are 15 now. It's Harry, Ron and Hermione. A group of Harry Potter cats, mm -hmm. and they turned 15 this year. So quite an age range. And that that way exceeds the the the, the wild life expectancy uh, of the cats, yeah. Yeah. So typically in the wild, I think average is about eight to ten, maybe eleven or twelve uh, if they're really lucky. Um, but here, our oldest cat was Solo. She lived to be 18 and a half years old. Um, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, and also that that working with the other departments and being able to study um, these animals, the, the uh, and in all of their life stages, I would imagine is, is invaluable. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I mean, part of it as well is really interesting for me is that I work with the the International Cheetah Stud Book as well. So keeping track of all the captive cats in all the facilities around the world and seeing kind of the averages that happen in captivity. So knowing that an 18 and a half year old is pretty old even for a captive cat. Um, but then yeah, in the wild as well, looking, um, looking at the wild data and knowing that even though these animals are captive, we're still giving them a pretty good quality of life compared to what they would, would get in the wild as well. Yeah, you mentioned the, the, the stud book, and, and that's uh, um, a, a huge part. Why, why don't you, you quickly explain what, what the stud book is, what the International Stud Book is? Yeah, so the, the International Cheetah Stud Book, uh, Lori started it. Uh, this, this year, uh, 2020 will actually be the 29th edition, I believe. Uh, 2021 will be the 30th edition of it. Um, but it keeps track of all of the captive cheetahs uh, in all of the facilities around the world. Um, so looking at every year, what I do is I compile all the data from all the different facilities. We look at births, we look at death, we look at any movements that are made. So some animals are transferred between facilities. Um, I compile all of that data. Um, I graph it, it gets put into a, a document. The document then gets sent out to other regional stud book keepers. So there's uh, some in North America, there's some in Europe. And what those uh, regional stud book keepers can then do with that data is look at breeding and looking at how we're going to sustain the captive population um, going forward. So cheetahs being a very inbred species, um, we need to be looking at the genetics and that's really important. Um, so we want to make sure that uh, individuals from similar family lines are not being bred together and introducing genetic variability to the captive population. And, and with the cheetah, that's probably more important than any other um, species of cat because of the lack of genetic diversity. So having that central database, all of that information in a, in a, in a concise um, controlled way um it, it makes decision making you know so much easier uh, and so much more efficient um for the facilities that are keeping uh, cheetahs around the world yeah yeah exactly and i mean it's really important to um to be keeping as as much inf getting as much information as we can so the stud book is a voluntary process for a lot of places, so you don't necessarily have to be part of a stud book, but the data we get from it is so valuable um, in terms of breeding and genetic lines, as you were saying. So it's something we're working on, especially in places like South Africa that do have a lot of breeders and everything that are 
that are happening right now, trying to get as much of that information as we can um, and looking at a, as detailed as we can of the overall population. So uh, at the moment, just putting together the 2019 studbook, uh, there's 1,820 total individuals that I have at the moment, so quite a few. Yeah, I, I, I'm going, and that's just that's some task, you know. It's yeah. yeah, excuse the pun, but I would imagine it's like herding cats sometimes. Just a little bit. There's a lot of follow-up emails and follow-up phone calls, and um, yeah, but it's it's really interesting. So I mean, that's kind of my that's why I love my job is because I get to go and feed cheetahs in the morning, and then my afternoon I get to do some some data entry and look at the stud book and. It's a really, really good balance, but I love, I love being able to work on the stud book. It's been a really interesting learning curve for sure, uh, taking it over from Kate uh, four years ago. Uh, the first year was a little bit interesting, but I think I've gotten into a good, good routine now, and uh, it's, I love it, absolutely love it. So um, I'm sure that uh, the viewers won't, won't, uh, won't grumble if we go back to cheetahs. Um, <laughs> They're not. <laughs> So, so keeping the, the cheetahs healthy, which is, you know, which is the number one goal, um, you know, the, the, the cats have found themselves in a situation that, uh, you know, we, we have to deal with. So <clears throat> when, when everybody uh, thinks about cheetah, they think about uh, maybe the speed, you know, and, and the, uh, the hunting abilities of the, of the cheetahs. So what ways do you kind of fulfill that natural um, that natural way of thinking for the cheetah, the, the na natural instincts? Yeah, so exercise is the biggest thing that we can do for them. Um, obviously, if they're, we're bringing them their food every day and they're not getting any exercise, they're going to become very fat and very lazy very quickly, which is not healthy. Um, so the biggest thing uh, that we use is we actually have a lure course set up at the center. Um, it's a uh, based on kind of a greyhound racing system in a way. It's a long piece of uh, string line. It's about 300 meters in length. It goes all the way around uh, one of our enclosures. We attach a piece of cloth to that line, an old t-shirt, an old piece of rag, and we're able to change the speed and change direction of that lure of the rag. And that's what the cheetahs are chasing. And that's how we give them their exercise, at least at the main center. Um, always a bit of a fun game for them. Otherwise, our other cats uh, that are not at the, the main center that are in other enclosures elsewhere, we actually use our vehicle. Um, so we have a white feeding bucky, a truck, that we put the, their food in. They know that truck means food and they will chase it uh, for their food every day. So we're, you know, a lot of it is about um, uh, mental stimulation as well as, as physical. When you say with a lure course where it changes speeds, changing direction. So it's not just the same old, same old every day. Exactly, yeah. So if we kept it the same all the time, the cheetahs are very smart and they will just sit in a corner and just wait for the lure to come back to them, pounce on it, and then get rewarded for catching it. Um, but so it may, we have to make it a little bit more challenging uh, for them. So they never quite know what to expect, but it is always an optional activity for them as well. So they can come in and run for as long and as hard as they want to. Um, so our young cats, it's always a really fun game. Uh, they will run and run and run and run, and we will actually eventually just have to stop because they're going to just keep going all day if they could. Uh, our older cats have figured out our system a little bit. They might do one or two really good sprints, and then they're, they just walk away, and they're done. So they get as much or as little exercise as they want. Being cats, we can't force them to do anything. Uh, and it's it's much the same as the diet. It's the individual, you know. So again, not everybody is uh, um, going to hit the gym every day. Um, some maybe just once or twice a week, and some oh, never, you know. Yep. <laughs> I'm not casting any aspersions over any individuals. I'm just, you know, <laughs> speaking generally. Yeah. With uh, with CCF being so diverse and and 
you know, in, involved in such holistic stuff. Um, do you, on, on a regular basis, do you find yourself overlapping with other departments of CCF? Yeah, with the, the Cheetah team, the biggest uh, section that we overlap with is obviously the veterinary team, the vet team. Um, because if we do have a sick animal or an injured animal, they're the first people that we will go to. Um, so, but it's been really interesting for me, um, having come here really with no experience. I've actually picked up quite a bit of, of veterinary kind of knowledge um, just by interacting with them. So learning how to give injections, learning how to uh, give fluids, learning how to treat wounds. Um, so the vet team, I would say, is definitely the biggest one uh, that we overlap with, but doing uh, talks for tourists and visitors that we unfortunately don't have a lot of right now, but normally we would. Um, doing tours, talking about the cats um, is also a, a big thing that we do. So we're not only looking after the cats every day, but we also get to talk to people about the cats. Being able to kind of help treat the animals, you know, with, uh, with uh, the cooperation with, with, the, with the veterinary team, um, I would imagine that that's, that's very useful because of that relationship that you've got with the cats, whereas, you know, you will be able to get a lot closer and there's a lot more trust um, in the cat. Would you, have, you, have you found that? Yeah, definitely. So the second we bring the vet over, the cat is fine. The cat pretends that they're not sick, they're not injured. If they haven't been eating for a few days, suddenly they're starving when the vet rocks up. Um, so, but yeah, it's been definitely that, that trust. I mean, it's really hard because when they do have a, a scary day on vaccination day, for instance, our yearly vaccines that we do with them, it's a scary day because we do have to contain them a little bit. We have to poke them with a needle and you can tell that that trust, you, you lose a little bit of it. Um, but we try and do as much kind of preparation again as we can and try and make it as as not scary as we can so being able to do their vaccines myself and Eli went out and did all the cats nearly in one day because we were able just to get them in with no issues versus had we brought the vet team out we do have some students right now as well and it would have been great practice for them to inject a few cats which we did let them do but if we brought them out to all the cats it would have taken us days to do it because the cat sees somebody new, somebody different, and suddenly all bets are off. No matter how much training you've done, no matter how much that routine has been really consistent up until that point, all of it goes out the window the second somebody else is involved. So after the after the the bad day, as you put it, uh, as far as the cats are concerned, do they get like you know that extra special meal afterwards as a, as a reward? Definitely, yeah. And we will normally just kind of leave them to it for a few days and we will cater, we'll spoil them extra over the next few days. So normally we would bring them up into the feeding camps every day for food, but after that scary day, some of them don't even want to come into the feeding camps for fear that something's going to happen and we'll bring out their food to them and give them extra, some extra attention, some extra love, tell them all, it's all going to be okay. They don't have to do this again until next year. And, um, but yeah, we always try and yeah, but your, your heart always breaks a little bit. You always feel like such a bad parent having to, to poke them, but it's for their own good. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and there's, there's a payoff to it. You know, they get the extra pieces of liver or, 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 or bits of pieces. So, you know, if they, if they, if they was able to analyze it, it's perhaps not such a bad day. It's true. It's true. <laughs> so your journey is, um, uh, has been quite, quite diverse in itself. I mean, you, you started off as a, as an intern at CCF. Is that right? I did. Yeah. So I started January, 2016. Um, I started as a, a general intern, uh, so I was doing a little bit of everything. I was working with the cheetahs, I was working with the dogs and the goats, uh, I was working in a little bit with the genetics team as well, um, and I was only supposed to be here for four months, and I've now been here four and a half years. 
um, which is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you did let other people know that you were staying. They're not standing at the airport waiting for you. Is that right? No, yeah. So I put a, a message on, on Facebook, I think, in, in May when I was supposed to come home initially and said, oh, just kidding. I'm staying until August. I'll be home in August. It's all fine. And then in August, I said, just kidding. They're going to pay me to stay here now. So I'm going to stay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I often feel with, uh, with interns that have, uh, have come through the center, it, it's not just about learning what you do want to do i think more importantly it kind of exposes you to stuff that you may have thought that you wanted to do but then that opens your eyes and and, and helps you choose a direction would you agree with that no definitely for sure because some people come and they say i want to work with cheetahs and that's all i want to do but then they meet the goats and then they fall in love with the goats or they get to do um, some outreach, some education work in the tourism department for a little bit and realize, hey, I really enjoy talking to people or I enjoy teaching. Um, so you never quite know what you're gonna get, but as you said, there is a little bit of everything here. So even if you don't know, it will help um, because you have a genetics lab, you have education, you have tourism, you have cheetahs, dogs, goats, sheep, every a little bit of everything mm, yeah it, it's uh it, it's certainly a what you know that some of the interns and and, and uh, like former interns that i've spoken to they just it, it's always part of, of them you know it, it's kind of almost gets ingrained and that level of understanding um because they get to to sample so much so so and such a wide variety of subjects I think it, it it's priceless. So you you mentioned like sponsoring the, the cheetahs um, and uh, I'll, <clears throat> I'll make a gratuitous plug that you know you can do that on on the website cheetah.org. So um, how much does that mean to 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 you the team and CCF um, just kind of knowing that that so many people of of uh, invested not just money but but also the the fact that they care so much how, how does that make you feel no it's it's such a nice feeling because we love them as their keepers i mean we kind of have to love them but honestly we do from the bottom of our hearts we do really love them but we want other people to love them as well and for to have that support and know that so many people do love them too is really it's nice to know that it's it's helping um in a way uh, that no i i i, t I totally agree I or the other day just the other day um i had a 12 year old little boy uh that came to center feeding and he was so knowledgeable he was saying how fast they were running he was telling me what their tear marks were for he was telling me why their tails are flat but and he was asking amazing questions. Is there such thing as an albino cheetah? Is there such thing as an all black cheetah? What genetic mutations do they have? Who would win in a fight, a falcon or a cheetah? Who can go faster? And it was a 12 year old and he was grilling me at such a feeling. I was feeling a little bit like, whoa, like I don't know if I'm smart enough for this kid. <laughs> but it's moments like that, that you're, it's, you can't, ever top that i don't think in that in itself i mean people would, would look at uh, people like yourself and, and the job that you're doing and and the, the work the ccf's doing as being the inspirers you know but but sometimes the, the the coin is flipped you know sometimes you're inspired by people's passion by people's interest by people's support you know because uh, none of us can do this alone you know, and to know that you, know, you mentioned the 12 year old there, you know, I mean, he's, he's the future, you know, um, because however much we want to think that we'll live forever, you know, and, and, and with, uh, with, with Laurie's old adage of, of conservation is never done, you know, it's never finished, you know, that, that must be inspiring to, to engage with those people with just a sense of there's a future. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, and it makes it that made my whole month. I think just that one little boy, that one interaction made my whole month. Um, 
And yeah, it's, the, it's those little moments that then pushes you forward to say, okay, I want to do better today. Here's what I want to do today. I want to accomplish this today. Because that little boy gave you that little spark of that inspiration and that drive to continue to know that you're doing good work. And the other, and, and if, if we go the other way as well, I'm sure if we, if we was lucky enough to speak to that 12 year old um, um, during, like, during these, these talks, I'm sure that he will always remember you, you know, because of, of, of the work that you do. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a mutual, it's a mutual thing, I'm, I'm sure, but it, it's nice to hear that, uh, you know, the, the, those little things sometimes, it, it, sometimes they, they seem quite innocuous, but, uh, but it's nice to know that those things are, are, are there and they're happening. Well, Becky, I, I, I know that everybody will be um, envious of, of the work you do, but at the same time, we realize how hard you work and <laughs> a daunting task uh, of doing this day in, day out, um, because however much um, the COVID-19 has, has affected everything and, and stuff, life has to go on you know the cheetahs can't work from home uh, yeah. <laughs> they can't be fed via zoom so uh, the work that you do is amazing and we want to thank you for it and 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 thanks for for sparing the time out of your really busy day uh, and joining us today so thanks very much becky no always my pleasure if you want to learn more about that project or any of the projects that CCF are involved with both in Namibia and around the world and also to make a donation or to sponsor a livestock guardian dog or a resident cheetah, please visit our website at cheetah.org. Now, if you like the video, please leave us a like and subscribe to our channel. And you can also set the reminder for further episodes on Cheetah TV. Thanks very much for joining us and I'll see you again next time.